Even if you're not in Russia or Ukraine, the war between them has probably got your attention. And for some outsiders, it's got a little more than that. You see, there's an army of volunteers or mercenaries, whatever you want to call them, fighting in Ukraine. And yeah, you guessed it, some of these fighters are from the Middle East. Vladimir Putin now says volunteer fighters will be joining Russian forces. U.S. officials have said they believe Russia is recruiting Syrians experienced in urban combat. They are reportedly being offered just a few hundred dollars to fight. Here's President Zelensky of Ukraine. Who came up with the idea of throwing mercenaries against our people? Thugs from Syria, from the country that was destroyed in the same way as the invaders are destroying us now. What's good, guys? I'm Sami Zaydan, and welcome to the first episode of the Essential Middle East podcast. What you're hearing now, a chance by Syrian fighters lined up to enroll. But not for the war going on in their own country. No, no, no. They're said to be volunteering for the Russians in Ukraine. And here's President Putin's answer after his defense minister told him about 16,000 fighters from the Middle East are ready to go and fight for the Kremlin. If you see that there are people willing to go there and help the people of Donbass as volunteers, especially free of charge, well, we should grant their wish and help them reach the combat zone. Do you know how many foreign fighters are estimated to be in Ukraine? You might want to sit down. 20,000 from 52 countries. Yeah, and they all have different motives and goals. I'll give you a moment to let it settle while I bring in our guest, shall I? He'll help us understand why people from the Middle East and around the world are fighting in Ukraine. Hello, I'm Wael Zayat, CEO of Engage, a national Muslim American civic organization. I'm speaking to you today from Washington, D.C. Now, I know that Russian officials have talked about 16,000 fighters from the Middle East being ready to come to Russia's aid. But do we know how many have actually made it to Ukraine, Wael? Well, according to U.S. intelligence sources, as well as the White House, they doubt that number has actually reached Ukraine. They really estimate that it's in the low hundreds, maybe at a thousand at most. The infamous group Wagner, which is a conglomerate really of groups, is thought to have in the high hundreds. And among them, there are likely a few hundred Syrians, maybe as many as 300, but nowhere near the 16,000 number so far. So that was just hype, was it? Yeah, totally. I mean, look, if you look at the timing of that announcement, it came a day after the Ukrainian government announced that they received over 20,000 applicants from 52 countries to fight on their behalf. So it really seemed like a kind of a, a PR campaign on the part of the Russians to show that they also right. have Right. If support. you say you've got how many thousand from 50 plus countries, well, we have them too kind of thing. Exactly. And of course, you know, the sad reality is that the Russians can only look at their friends in Bashar al-Assad in Syria. So, you know, maybe next there'll be some North Korean green men who also want to enlist on their behalf. <laughs> That's All right. Did they have a choice or did the regime, shall we say, help them reach their decision to volunteer for Russia? Well, again, you know, apparently there are maybe 10 to 12 recruitment centers popping up around you know, the country in Syria. Folks don't seem to be forced, but some are really compelled because of the financial incentives. I'm seeing figures ranging from 1500 to as much as $7,000 for enlisting and perhaps benefits of up to $50,000 to families of those who are killed in action. So look, there's real economic struggles in Syria because of the war, and there are folks who are compelled to do it. I haven't seen, you know... So this is really about money? That's why people are signing up? It's money. Oh, yeah. I mean, why the hell would anyone go from Syria to Ukraine to get killed? You know, it's desperation. I could see the regime forcing some former militiamen who oppose them and now have, quote-unquote, reconciled with them, kind of forcing them to go. I haven't seen reporting of this happening on a large scale. And right now, so far, the few hundreds who have signed up have done it for financial reasons. Take us through the process. Well, how does a foreign fighter join the battle in Ukraine? 
If you're fighting on behalf of the Ukrainian government, it seems pretty straightforward. You fly to a neighboring country after you've been accepted, and probably you'll have a handler at the point of entry, whether it's land or airport. And from there, they take you to a military training facility, maybe a vetting facility, and then forward you go based on your abilities and your skill set. For the Russians, what I'm hearing, at least for the Syrian component, they fly them to the Russian air base in Syria, Hamaymin, and from there, they fly them somewhere in Russia, close to the Ukrainian border, and then they deploy them into theater. Though again, I have not seen actual Syrians in Ukraine. What I've seen is folks enlisted, flown to Russia for training, and that's where they're at. Now, there are other mercenaries in Ukraine. So wait a minute, at this point in time, we're not even sure if Syrians have actually made it into Ukraine to fight for Russia. No, what we've seen is a few hundreds who've actually arrived in Russia for training. I haven't seen credible reporting that they are in Ukraine fighting. Interesting. Well, it's not just Syrians, is it? There are reports of Chechens, Azeris, Americans, Australians. I mean, almost you name it. Even from groups with alleged neo-Nazi leanings. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, when the so-called Islamic State showed up, the big deal was all these foreign fighters were coming to fight on its behalf. And lo and behold, Ukraine is attracting kind of the same dynamics. So it just goes to show you there's always a customer for these kind of conflicts nowadays. Why is Ukraine becoming such a magnet for all of these people with, I mean, they have such a diverse background and political leanings. Does it make it also a little bit different from, let's say, the foreign fighters who are going to Syria or Iraq? Well, certainly. I mean, those were different types of conflicts and they attracted, you know, a certain personality with certain perhaps ideological leanings. Right. There seemed to be some more ideological uniformity in those conflicts. Well, in Ukraine, really, there is also kind of a bifurcation of the ideology. It's either you are believing in the self-determination right of the Ukrainian people and you are, you know, completely opposed to what you consider to be the unprovoked attack by Russia. And on the other side, you are perhaps anti-Western or you're really chafing at the imperial control of NATO and America, and you must go and defend Russian interests. But well, is it really that simple? I mean, we've heard reports of like a Muslim Chechen fighting for the Ukrainians on the same side as we know people who are accused of having neo-Nazi backgrounds who allegedly greased some of their bullets in pig fat. Well... I mean, I was referring to kind of those who go there to fight for ideological reasons. If we're speaking about those who are being enlisted by Russia to go, it's much more of a mercenary kind of affair. Look, Wagner, for example, assembles former military intelligence agency and federal security agency Russian members who are you know, retired and bring them to these theaters for money. They want to make money. They're not in there for ideological reasons. Same thing for the Chechens. I mean, those are loyal to the Putin-backed, Putin-installed leader in Chechnya, Khodorov, who is a notorious dictator, basically. And yeah. they're loyal to him. Yeah, no, but I was talking about even the Ukrainian side. On the Ukrainian side, there have been reports of even Chechens on that side as well. And we know there are reports of people with sort of extreme right wing, and shall we say not very Muslim-friendly sentiments also on the Ukrainian side. That's a bit of an ideological divergence, isn't there? Everyone finds a reason to fight for sometimes the same struggle. We saw this when Turkey invaded northern Syria. All kind of random people who otherwise would never get along together on the right and the left somehow showed up to fight with the Syrian Democratic Forces because they identified with somehow their cause for liberation. Now, for Ukraine, there is a very, very, very troubling Islamophobic element in that conflict right now. As you mentioned, you know, folks who are going there because they want to fight against Chechens who are fighting with Russia. But there are also Chechens and Tatar Muslims, by the way, from Crimea, who are fighting in there because I think correctly they identify that this is a struggle for sovereignty and freedom for Ukraine and for the people who live in it, which includes a not too insignificant Muslim minority. These conflicts really bring together folks from different backgrounds because they see in the conflict what they want to see. And when you add money incentives, then that's going to really, for those who need the money or desiring to make more money, that's usually going to transcend their ideologies. And so that brings a whole mix 
of all types of people as well. So it's a mess. Some who see the struggle of the Ukrainians is similar to what they would see as a freedom struggle for their people who are ruled by the Russian Federation. Yeah, that's very well said. And you know, there's a history of indigenous liberation movements in the Caucasus and Central Asia against Russian rule that's still ongoing. Let me tell you a story now. The story of Lane Perkins. He's an American Navy veteran, a husband, a father of a two-year-old son from San Diego. He left his home and came to fight in Ukraine, and this is what he told an American reporter. Are you willing to risk your life for this country? I definitely think that fighting the war here is worth it because it keeps the war away from the home front. Well, and what do you make of Lane's reasoning? You know, his reasoning is understood, I think. His genesis brings me back to remembering the war on terror and really the George Bush II administration, because the way they justified U.S. interventions abroad, particularly in Iraq, is so we don't have to fight the wars here. I think that's a bit misplaced, because look, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not going to lead to Russia coming to the United States. Let's be clear about that. But it will have a ripple effect in Europe that will impact our lives here in the U.S. in many different and perhaps unforeseen negative ways. So I understand the sentiment. I don't think it's exactly precise. How many Western foreign fighters are there? Do we know from places in Europe, America, Canada, and so on? I really have seen the 20,000 figure that Ukrainian President Zelensky, you know, mentioned regarding those who have applied. Mm. How many are in there? It's going to be a smaller number, but it looks like it's in the thousands, particularly because it is a permissive environment from the Western countries and the rest of the world, it seems. Mm. And obviously the Ukrainian government is, is you know, welcoming, though. All right. Russia calls those fighting for Ukraine mercenaries. Are they? Technically, I don't know if they're getting paid. I think it depends. I think of them as volunteers for the defense of Ukraine. But look, semantics, right? Like somebody's foreign fighter is somebody's terrorist. We know what that's all about. If they're getting paid and they're coming for money, yeah, they're mercenaries or they're coming and volunteering and risking their lives and the world they come from on behalf of defending the Ukrainian people. I think those are straight up freedom fighting volunteers. Here's what Ukraine's military attache in the US calls them. If this person fits the requirement, we uh, give the person uh, contact in Ukraine and person goes uh, to Ukraine co and then signs a contract with armed forces of Ukraine. So this, this is not mercenaries who are coming to earn money, not at all. This is a good people of goodwill who are coming to assist Ukraine to fight for freedom. He doesn't sound too different from how you're describing them, does he? He doesn't. Look, we sometimes get in the habit of wanting to create moral equivalency and coming across as unbiased. But look, there's a very clear difference here. Russia invaded Ukraine and there's right and wrong. I mean, I really believe that. And so somebody coming and sacrificing to fight on behalf of the Ukrainian people. Look, they may not be good people themselves. Who knows who these people are, right? But if they're coming to fight for that cause, they're doing good. And obviously, can they commit mistakes and crimes while they are there? Yes, and that's the responsibility of the Ukrainian government to ensure that they don't. But this is not a moral equivalency situation. Russia invaded, they're bringing mercenaries with proven human rights violations. I don't see it being the same. All right, whatever we want to call them, volunteers, mercenaries, this is not a new phenomenon, isn't it? No. No, I mean, wasn't there like a French foreign legion or something? I think it's still out there. Uh, yeah, it's still out there. Okay, I don't know what that is, but sounds like mercenaries. It's existed all throughout history, hasn't it? Almost in every war you can think of. Remember Blackwater in Iraq? How can we forget? Ugh, honestly, like some of the stuff we're seeing now, I still think we're paying the price of that awful episode in history. Blackwater, other groups that keep popping up. I think that might be the way of the future, unfortunately because it gives governments plausible deniability. It lowers the political consequences for them. It's more difficult to hold them accountable if there are violations. Russia really has picked up this habit and they've sent their mercenaries all over the world. I mean, they're popping up in Mozambique, in Mali. You're talking about the Wagner Group now. Yeah, Sudan, Libya. Well, how involved in the fighting are they, do we know? In the fighting in Ukraine? 
They are somewhat involved, particularly on the Eastern Front. But again, their numbers are not that high. They might be increasing them given the catastrophic losses Russia's conventional forces have suffered. Again, right now I'm hearing maybe a thousand of them. So even if they triple or quadruple them, it's still going to be a small footprint, but they are doing active combat. All right. One thing which is perhaps a little different to the situation in Syria or Iraq is that now you have people, even Westerners, coming and going to a war zone, Ukraine, and right under the nose of the intelligence services with little consequences because there's no real law in place against people going and fighting in Ukraine as there is in some of the other conflict zones, right? That's right. This conflict has been deemed as a just war. It's not like there's a law for it, but that's how it's been deemed politically in the media in the West. And therefore, that paves the way for this sort of activities to take place without demands for legislation. However, if this becomes a protracted conflict and it drags on and more folks keep going to Ukraine or news emerge of you know atrocities or crimes or war crimes taking place by those groups on either side, but particularly in the West, you will see calls to regulate it and perhaps to stop it. There have been reports of some right-wing groups going to Ukraine to get battlefield experience, to get training and coming back to their home countries. Is this potentially turning into a case of them using this as really a launch pad to pursue something else in their home countries? That would be extremely troubling. And I really don't know what the exact numbers are, but this is something, particularly in the US, we absolutely have to keep an eye on and prevent. I mean, if there are known white supremacists I mean, look what they did on January 6th here, which is a practice run, in my opinion, when they stormed the Capitol. If there are known U.S. white supremacists and banned groups like the Oath Keepers and others going to Ukraine, yeah, they should not even be able to get on a flight because they can absolutely use that experience and that training for future domestic operations. It's something that they've talked about. And look, the FBI and the Department of Justice has identified white supremacy and particularly those violent groups as the greatest domestic threat in the United States. And it should be taken seriously. You know, they often say history is the product of the unintended consequences of political decisions. Who knows where this could go, right? You know, I think the West was on the right track to oppose the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. I think they did what they needed to do to support the Mujahideen there. Did they do it because they loved the Mujahideen of Afghanistan? No, they wanted to defeat the Soviet Union. But it helped the Afghan people liberate themselves from the Russians. But we know how that turned out later because the international community abandoned Afghanistan and left them to their own affairs. But to me, the way I look at it is less about the unintended consequences and more about sustaining support for those countries and societies post-conflict. If we go ahead and support Ukraine today and forget about it after the Russians leave, if and when they leave, you're going to see all kinds of problems come out of that country. And so that's the lesson of Libya. That's the lesson of Afghanistan. But I don't think it should be used as an excuse not to intervene on behalf of people when they're getting butchered by whether an invading army or their own government. Wael, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Thanks so much for the chat. Thank you for inviting me. It really is an important topic, and I just wish for this conflict to come to an end and for just people to be able to live in the peace that they deserve. So thank you for covering it. Thank you. A big thanks to our listeners, too, for joining us. Let me give some credits to the people behind the scenes, our producers, Hayat Mongodin and Khaled Sultan, and George Elwir, of course, he takes care of sound design. A shout out to our lead engagement producer, Ayel Malik, and assistant engagement producer, Munira Dosari. We can't forget the big boss, of course, our executive producer, Omar Saleh. I'm your host, Sami Zaydan. We'll chat again next week. Hold up. 